I'm Antonio. And I'm Jordy. We're the Data Science Imposters. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Data Science Imposters. My name is Jordy. I'm here with my buddy Antonio. What's going on, man? Jordy, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. What's happened since we've spoken? Let's see. I have no idea what's happened. So I'm going to go backwards in time from a... Um, the most that we have to talk about, I know this data science podcast and not a space exploration one, but, but we're scientific the, nerds. <laughs> yeah, we're nerds. Um, Jeff Bezos and, uh, Richard Branson just went into space. Yep. So that, if you're listening I mean, to this about a week ago, kind of happened. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, that, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I, I, so today is when Jeff Bezos went into space at, I don't know, 10 o'clock this morning. I forget exactly when, 9 o'clock this morning, mm-hmm. Eastern time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was amazing to see. Uh, so, so I was talking to my father-in-law and saying, like, look, when you, know, when you were growing up, it was countries sort of um, yeah. going yeah. You know, going to see head to head to see who would get um, into space first or into um, on the moon first, right? Uh, and then now it's companies, right? It's it's uh, you know it's international companies that are now you know going for that, and you yeah. know the fact that people, you know, at one point, um, you know, and, and I guess we can use the the term astronaut. I haven't looked up the definition for it. But, uh, you know, you always thought of astronaut as a lot more than just someone who went past, you know, into outer space. Yep, yep. But they're billing, you know, all these people who are doing space tourism, I guess. I'm glad you brought uh, that up because that is a very important distinction. Jeff Bezos is not an astronaut. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't. So so let's let's I you know what? I'm going to do the what do you know what, do what we do that the define astronaut. Right. Do it live. Uh, We're doing it live. A person who is trained to travel in a spacecraft. That's right. So let me ask you this, Antonio. Although generally reserved for professional space travelers, the terms are sometimes applied to anyone who travels into space, Whoa. including scientists, politicians, journalists, and tourists. I wonder if they just changed this recently. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure they did. I mean, we've all been on a plane to our uh, in-laws' house <laughs> uh, many, many states away. None of us are aircraft pilots. I mean... No, just... no, we're not pilots. We're not... Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, we're not, we're not trained... Directing. We're not trained to fly the aircraft that takes us to Orlando, Florida. You know what I mean? Yeah, but no, the he, thing flies itself, right? He's not an astronaut. No, I, I'm going to put my foot down here. <laughs> he is not an astronaut. However, I will give him credit. Him, Branson, I know uh, Musk is on the list because he, he'll he get there also. Um, they want to commercialize space travel. That's what this is about. They want people to butts in seats, feel zero orbit, look at the Earth, you know, see the that little film of the ozone layer, whatever they call it, right. and then fall back into Earth and just have a new appreciation for life. I mean, poetically, that's what they're saying, but they're, they're just trying to commercialize Look, I space travel. I wouldn't get on a roller coaster ride at Six Flags or uh, you know Magic <laughs> Kingdom. There's no way I would get on. T- First of all, I can't afford it. But besides that point, well, forget um, that. Let's say you could. Let, let's say they they make this affordable. I, I don't to the think. I man. think I would. I, I would be so nervous and so uncomfortable that I wanted to the, ask you this being question. Being able to see space, right? Like being able to see what you see and being in zero G for it. It sound. It, you know, I, I saw the whole video. It was about three or four minutes, right? Where mm-hmm. that whole experience is taking place, flying at that. You know, flying at two two thousand miles per you know per hour yeah they broke the sound barrier uh, twice you know yeah yeah he's 60 uh, miles above earth and um, um, his whole flight was what 11 minutes all in all in like rocket i think it was it was a little bit longer the descending takes a little bit longer okay. with the parachutes and whatnot um but yeah it's it's less than 20 minutes so yeah. you can imagine um you know let's say these space flights are going to be 20 million dollars that's you know, a million dollars a minute, right? So it, it's pretty expensive. I mean, the experience is, is one that you cannot get, right? If you think about fine art and collectibles and things like that, um, the number of people who will go to outer space, um, we, we expect it to increase, but 
you know, you are one of no all you know, those what names is it fifty fit. something was yeah, they uh, fit the number on a sheet that, of paper mm-hmm. right all those names fit on a sheet of paper for sure. What does that say though? I want I want us to talk about this very important point. These men are trying to commercialize space travel, and they both go on the inaugural flights. So many things can happen on that flight. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, we're not, it is a very dangerous uh, yeah. affair. And yet they both chose to do it. What if they would have, what if, I mean, uh, we, we're not a what if podcast. Obviously there's a lot of tests, tests, um, oh you know, test flights that happen. It, it, regardless, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think I would do it. I, I think they just said, hey, I'm going to do it. You can do it too. It's pretty safe. Right? That's the message, right? That's I'm a, a millionaire. Message. I That's got tons certainly to lose. a message. Yeah. You know, don't and, worry, uh, Antonio. Get on the roller coaster, baby. You That's, know, when you think about this, this this might be the reason that Jeff Bezos stepped down from Amazon, right? Um, I, I could just imagine. Him get on like, that flight. Yeah, I could just imagine that there's a lot of implications to that. But so there was a big debate. Uh, there was this whole space to. So there's a lot of different debates happening. One debate is um, whether whether Richard Branson actually went to outer space, mm-hmm. right? And 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 this all stems around what's called the the Carmen line. Yes, you guys can look it up. Uh, uh, it's uh, like it's basically this this line or this this imaginary boundary that separates um, outer space, right? And saying that you're in outer space. Um, the Earth's atmosphere and outer space. And so you can go to Wikipedia and find out about it. But apparently, um, Branson did not go beyond that point, which is he did not go beyond the Kármán line. So he was actually still in the Earth's atmosphere. And so... But he still felt zero gravity. He still felt zero yes. gravity. Yes, yes, yes. key. Because that happened before. That's what happens before that space is, is defined. Yeah. It's the international, internationally recognized boundary between the aerodynamically discernible atmosphere and space, a distinction that's recognized by the Federation of Aeronautic Internationale, which is a Switzerland-based uh, organization. This is the organization that sanctions and records airspace travel. So that's pretty interesting. That's, so that's, you know, like... To most of us, and, and I don't know what the technical limitations were there. I don't know if just there wasn't enough fuel. Um, the the Branson setup is a, a, a lot different than um, the space shuttle setup. Let's talk about that. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So let's say you do want to go into space, and uh, you know you saw the videos of Neil Armstrong getting on a rocket and getting fired up. That's what Jeff did. He sat on a rocket vertical. He was in a capsule. He got shot up from Earth. And then they floated back down. Branson was in an airplane on top of an airplane <laughs> flying 45, you know, 35,000 feet, whatever the launch point was. And he launched from there. So he felt his was more of a traditional commercial flight. And then he took off from an interme- a point, halfway point, let's call it. Well, it's not halfway, but you know what I mean. And um, felt uh, weightlessness at that point. So it's two different methods and and i've read different pros and cons you know if something goes wrong with the rocket uh jeff bezos pros and cons something goes wrong with the rocket they can always hit the uh you know the emergency switch disconnect from the rocket the rocket goes Mm -hmm. boom boom the catapult the 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 capsule safe and they fly back down whereas branson's tethered to that plane that plane is taking him up and taking him down Mm -hmm. um so a little bit of what you'd rather experience if you are lucky enough and you're listening to this podcast you're sitting on $20 million and you're like, eh, I want to go to space. I don't know what Elon's options are going to be. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do like that, that Branson did, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, the what, what's the, um, what's the name of the, the company here? Virgin Galactic. Uh, uh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah. I like, I do like that. They took the airplane approach. Like I, li- I like mm-hmm. that. That's different. It, it just felt um, more natural. Um, it felt like something a consumer might like more easily relate to and just yeah. say, hey, we're just going to go a little bit farther. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And his flight, it's important to know, the f- 
Branson's flight, Virgin Galactic, that's a 59-minute ordeal. Hmm. Whereas Jeff Bezos' flight, it's much, much faster. I think Antonio said 20 minutes. Um, it's like, wham, bam, you're done. Hmm. So, so the first debate was who actually went to outer space. So can that's up someone, to you. Can hey. someone say neither? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other, the, the other debate was, uh, and I see this all around social media. So do you think, and people argue that, hey, these, you know, these billionaires are all fighting to go to space. They should be doing something better for, you know, for the world or they, you know, they should be doing this and that. What, like, they shouldn't be doing this. What do you think? Like, what do you think about this? Before I answer that, I do think yeah. we hear that noise because Jeff Bezos, not hours after he f- did the his yeah, flight, right. he was talking about protecting this this precious pearl we call Earth, and he even said, "You know what? Uh, we should all look into getting all polluting type industries and running them from space, since space travel is going to be attainable very close in the near future." All those industries should be in space and we should stop polluting our atmosphere. So he had something in the chamber already for, for that very critique. Um, do I think is he's being genuine? I don't know. Maybe in his euphoria at the moment, maybe. Um, but to answer your question, I don't know. I'm 50-50 on that, Antonio, honestly. Um, when they 50-50 were made, is not allowed on this podcast. It's not allowed, right? right? No. This is, the 50-50 is just like the cheap way out. It's, I know. it's either you, you know. I don't think billionaires owe anybody anything. Okay. That's, that's my, like, you know. Mm-hmm. That's the company. That's the, that's the Jordy company line. If you're that's living your, your life, that's the Jordy company line. If you're living your life expecting people to give you stuff, you're going to be disappointed a lot, right? So I don't expect Jay Bezos, Jeff Bezos to the comf, you know, because he has such an easy life and so much extra money. He's just going to give it away. Right. Um, Which is, he, would it be great if he, he does I don't know if you, to- I don't know if you heard he, and, and people would say, oh, that's nothing. But you, did you hear he gave two recipients um, $100 million each? Um, after the flight, he gave two recipients, um, uh, uh, Van Jones and, and Jose Andres, a um, hundred million dollars each to use as they wish, however they want, um, uh, because of their um, efforts, philanthropic effort, efforts. Who says that's not a lot of money? Who in their right I, mind? People who uh, <laughs> hey, look. I, so, so here's my thought process, right? Okay. Um, I think people like everyone has their own opinions and, and whatnot. Sure. And, and in my opinion. Is that is this the Borges I'd company br- line? Is yeah, company look, line? look, um, it's not like you know, it's not like um, you know. I, I think they're they're pushing the boundaries of something, and space yes. is one that is is the thing that a lot of comp- uh, a lot of or, um, countries have underfunded. Um, Fair Our enough. NASA prog- program does not get enough funding, right? And, and the fact that the commercial side of it has gone in, right? Obviously, there's, you know, there's cost to everything. There's that amount of fuel being burned. There's there's yeah. a lot of things that's, that, that are taking place, right? Um, and, and so some of those things are going to be market-driven, right? Um, but I think to say like, oh, these two people are fighting to be, you know, it's like, to fighting to be who is the first in space. It's like, well, they've also advanced space technology. technology. Yeah. Right? 100%. They've also employed people. And what was it? A Blue Origin? 15, what, 15 or 17 years that's been a company? Mm-hmm. It's, Not making know. a cent. Not making you know? a dime. So, yeah. you know, I sometimes I, I think like, okay... And I, I, you know, you, I would love to have someone on, on to make, you know, the other argument because I think we're, we're fairly in line here. We're, you know, on, on the, on the view, there that this, this is good for, 
society, right? Like the the fact that people are pushing, and overall, sure, there's there has overall, to be yes. there has to be safeguards. There have to be um, some market in- interventions with other things, right? If it's if the fuel that is being burned is too, you know, it's too hazardous or whatever it is, then the market and and governments have to intervene, right? Like there sure. has to be something that that sets that right. <laughs> Well, Jeff, uh, the Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' rocket, um, its exhaust is uh, oxygen. It, it's an oxygen-based fuel. Um, someone's going to go crazy when they listen to this, but I forget what it is, but whatever it is, its uh, its waste is just steam. Mm. So he already looked into making that a cleaner you know, byproduct than gasoline, right? Then the Mazda I drive on paper is more... Uh, hazardous to the atmosphere than the rocket he just launched into space. Mm. And to your point, you can look at it as face value. These two billionaires, you know, uh, trying to show off and do a race. But when countries did that back in the mm-hmm. 50s and 60s to get to the moon, the mm-hmm. technological investments and advancements that came from that are, you, there's books on it, you know, yeah. from, from yeah. duct tape to the microwave to radio waves to microwaves, you, you name it. That's Listeners, we tried to I'm get not fact checking Jordy, so you guys fact don't, check. Don't, check don't, him. don't, don't. You're gonna find like, I'll, I'll, I'll send, like send, microwaves, but I'll you know, send, <laughs> I'll send you his, uh, his phone number. <laughs> his phone number. But the point being, there's a byproduct from that that often gets dismissed from yeah, pushing absolutely. the boundaries, like you said, like pushing the boundaries. Um, yeah. So I, you know, that I had we had to talk about it, and I, and I know we digress for. For 16 minutes on it on the topic but i i thought it was it was fair i it's think it's a awesome, historic man. going into yeah. space i mean i'm a little bit i'm not convinced yet as you are not in terms of the safety for the common person um i want to see a couple hundred thousand people do it <laughs> and i'm not dropping uh, six figures on it either so i guess we may never experience it but maybe our kids will Or their kids. Somebody. If, if we can, if we can live past some of these weather changes that are happening, ah, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> they are real, however, but we'll be fine. Um, I don't know if we, if you have another data science item on the topic, but what do you have? Well, what are you thinking of, about? Speaking of weather and catastrophic mm-hmm. events that have happened, mm-hmm. um. I can't stop thinking about, I know you and I haven't touched base. You've been on vacation. I've been on vacation. Mm. We have families, people. So we've been like ships in the night. But the terrible, uh, goes without saying it's terrible, but just talking about the science of it, uh, the the condominium that fell in Miami Mm -hmm. Beach, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, Of course, it's a tragedy. But on scientific level, what what did you think when you you saw that or, or digesting that information? Yeah, I mean, you know what? I was actually down in in Orlando, uh, not too far away from Miami, three hours away. Um, and it was, you know, at first it was just like it, it didn't register in my head, right? Like it wasn't mm-hmm. something that came up because I was just thinking, like sometimes, and I, I think we have de- desensitized ourselves to to events sometimes. Yeah, that like it's almost not catastrophic enough. We see, you so know, much like, news. and I know it's yeah. like. I know, I know it sounds terrible, mm-hmm. but like we, I, I think our brains have have gotten to this point, and and it's terrible, and it's it's awful. But I, I did hear it multiple and multiple times, and I was staying with one of our friends um, mm-hmm. who is in construction, so he did bring it up uh, a number of times. And then I started reading the articles. So, mm-hmm. Okay, what, well, like what, like what happened here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's always hard to tell, right? So I I used to work in um I used to work in an internal audit, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things we do is we you know we would go into a group and we'd say, hey, show us, tell us about the risks in your organization and tell us about the controls you have in place to mitigate those risks, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like what what generally happens is that people would have like. You know, like they would have some controls and they'd be okay for for the scenario. Um, but sometimes they'd be a little bit weak. Um, and the reason they, the, the, you know, the controls were weak is because when you think about risk, you think about, um, 
you think about impact, the the way you think about risk is you think about impact and likelihood, and you multiply those two things. Yeah, and that is becomes your risk component. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's, that's it. like that that's the formula. That's it. So likelihood and impact, right? And now how you measure these two, right? Whether you use data, right? Whether you use a, a formula or whether you use scales, sometimes we would use scales, right? Like what's the impact, low, medium, high, right? And what's the, uh, you know, what's the likelihood, low, medium, and high? Mm-hmm. If you have a high and a medium, that becomes a high. It's a if high. you have a medium, medium, it becomes a medium. Well, however you justify that, you do that. And that becomes your risk assessment. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is when things don't happen, right? Ever. When you don't yeah. have ransomware attacks. Let's think about ransomware, right? Yeah. That's one thing. Yeah. When you don't have those attacks, likelihood just keeps triggering down uh, okay oh, no. we haven't had we haven't had a building collapse in the last 25 years likelihood is low right mm-hmm. we had um what is it the 747s uh what was it the 747s it was three years ago uh the, um the, was it no. the four anyway we, we hadn't had saying. any plane crashes right mm-hmm. and then we had Three plane crashes in a row, all of the same model. Oh, not to cut you off, but we had the episode on on the Boeing flight where it just was a, a malfunctioning part in the flight over Asia and India. Um, that's what you're referring to. It's like three yes. three in a year. Yeah. So now the the likelihood obviously changes. Um, so in any case, I, I think what was happening is you know people would look at things and say, okay, well, you know, yeah, we'll remediate this. Um, you know, when when we get to it. When we get to it, mm-hmm. and I don't think anyone said, "Hey, you know the build." I don't think anyone braised it to the point of, "Hey, the building could collapse," um, because even when I was looking at uh, reading the article about what they were going to do first, their focus was like on fixing, like I think it was uh, fixing the area around the pool, not even mm-hmm. the structural uh, parts of it. Correct. It's like some of the cosmetic. A lot of it was parts. cosmetic, you know, exposed rebar, yeah. you know, bad reports on paper. Obviously, hindsight twenty twenty, yeah, everyone goes look at all these reports, how bad they were. But in actuality, to your point, what they would have done, what I don't think would have stopped the inevitable. Um, and I think, yeah, I think uh, sinkholes are a thing, <laughs> and uh, they don't happen in our country as much, uh, but they happen. You know, there's there's water moving below your feet every day when you walk the streets. Um, and the more it happens, the more it rolls the ground around it. And Is that feet. what they ultimately um, said it was? That and structural negligence, yeah. Uh, again, and um, news is changing on this topic daily. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is active. Uh, it's a moving target in terms of, of, of information. And they may never find out. But how how does that impact does that impact you at all um, working in, in a field like construction or is it just so different? Well, that's the thing. One of the articles I read um, is well, when this building was built in the eighties, in the uh, in excuse my English, but in the cocaine monetized Miami South Beach industry, the codes the building codes were different. So building codes uh, imp- get improved upon and get changed. You know, every every so often, as they should, with new advancements and technology, and some older buildings just don't get. You know, if you don't if you don't make a change, you don't have to quote unquote change it. It's grandfathered in, right? It's up to code because when it was built 20, 30 years ago, it was up to code then. But if you were to do the same building in Miami, you wouldn't do it the way that one was done. You know what I mean? So there's many hurricane law. Uh, uh, you know, rules and regulations rules that have come into place and regulations, you know, Sandy in New York, it's, if you live in the East Coast, you know that there's, you see hospital now with, 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 with gates and floodgates where you never thought you'd see those before. That's why that is, to Antonio's point. An event happened, you learn from it, you change. Well, things are going to happen now in, in, in places in coastal cities like Miami and, uh, and the such and the like, because I, I think, um, yeah, the ground is eroding. 
you know? They don't have bedrock the way we do in Manhattan, right? Manhattan, that's why our skyscrapers are the way they are, right? You don't have those skyscrapers everywhere, you know, for that reason. It's not because uh, the money, but it's part of it. But it's the right. geological conditions of this place. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. And Miami's new, unique to Florida where they have skyscrapers up there, down there, excuse me. Mm-hmm. You, you've been in Florida. You don't see skyscrapers all over the place. Mm-hmm. But Miami does, you know. Mm-hmm. So things are going to change, I think. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. Not only that. So then I was thinking about because you know we we talked about this before, and and what happens is you have an event, and then everyone reports on it, right? Yeah. Um, and then everyone wants to make an article on top of an article and on top of an article. Um, and one of the big things was. Um, uh, just sort of moving a little bit is um, COVID being um, the killer of cities. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I, you know, I don't know where this started, but articles came out that said, Hey, people are moving out of New York city in droves, right? Like people are getting out of New York city. New Show York me. city is dead, <laughs> right? Yeah. New York city is dead. Um, real estate prices are dropping, you know, all, all of these things right, are happening in New York City. New York City is no longer going to be the capital of the world. It was like this, that you know, theme. and that obviously, yeah. obviously for brains like ours where we're so desensitized to information, they, they have to throw it like that. Otherwise, we won't read the article, right? Yeah, you won't click it. <laughs> um, but, but, but then, so, so because I clicked on one of these um, articles about the condo in Miami, I started getting more updates about, you know, the real estate and how the real estate in Miami is now going to drop um, mm-hmm. and how people are reconsidering buying in Miami and mm-hmm. all of these things that happen. And I wonder, I wonder how much data is playing into this versus, um, you know, journalistic or I shouldn't even say journalistic, but yeah, because sen- it's, uh, sen- sensationalism, it? yes. right? Yes, that's what that is. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how much that goes into play there because for COVID, for instance, I don't think that the people who wrote the articles about New York City being dead actually looked at the last time we had a major pandemic and what happened to the centers of places that held a lot of people. I don't know if they did that analysis. I haven't done it, so I can't speak about it, but I'm pretty sure they did that they either. didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what you would do, right? Hey, what was yeah. the last time? What was the last thing that happened to cities when, when this happened? But, but here's the thing from a data science perspective. Why is that still not enough, Jordy? Why is what not enough? Even if they did do that, even if they did look at back at what happened in um, you know, the Spanish flu. Oh my gosh, because the, the world's different and there's one data point and one you data know, point. That's right? one data like point. You have one data point. You know how they heated their houses? They just started fires inside of them. I mean, it's just a different time. <laughs> uh, but yes, to, 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 to your point, it's one data point out of you can get so many. What, what's, what's the average income? What's the, what's, what do people do for a living? Right. You know, um, how do clustered they have to leave their people? house to leave? How, yeah, how many people, people in the household? Are clustered, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, is there public transportation? Is everyone driving? Is everyone on, the, on a horse and buggy? You right. could do those comparisons. To your point, they may not be apple to apple, but you can get something going if you if you really care to figure out are people leaving cities and has it happened before, right? Um, but I don't. <laughs> it's so funny you said that because I've seen articles that are saying New York City's back recently. So it's just the. Yeah, it's just it, New York yeah. City's back. New York City's back. I'm like, what? It never. Le- what are you guys talking about? Like, <laughs> it's just the. It sucks that these folks have to make money the way they do, with the clicks and the, and and the eyes. I mean, I know if I click something and I read the first paragraph and I and when I leave, I'm like, I'm not reading this. They they've done their job, right? It doesn't matter if I like the article or not. Uh, you can't leave them a review. <laughs> can't write them a letter. It doesn't matter. So it's harder to consume uh, good content just because there is so much content. And it's also harder yeah. to get accurate information. You have to really make it an effort. And I know we've talked right, about look, this a million times. And it takes times. work. It takes work. It takes work. 
it takes work and time and um Mm -hmm. if at the end of the day you do all that work and you still don't capture the eyes and uh, you know uh, as much as other people are capturing them you know like then what's the point right um yeah you're doing something wrong the the message is not and and and, and that's a challenging part too right like with so much going on now it's not like if the if the new york times says something right like to me it has some weight but not to everyone right like because they'll say, "Oh, this blogger said said the opposite." I go, "Who? <laughs> what?" To, to to put it on the New York Times, though, they have they have these open forum kind of uh, articles that they put out there, or some opinion pieces that get picked up and quoted by people. See, see, look, this was in the New York Times, and this is complete BS. You're like, "Well, well, well, it is in the Times, but that's an opinion piece." Like, right. So you know they should be careful as well in terms of what gets out there i mean listen everyone loves the the top 10 buzzfeed list because they're funny and they're interesting and if that's what you're looking for then fine go 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 consume that but sometimes you just want good information um and the new york times shouldn't be you know catering to the buzzfeed crowd um i I really think they they will lose you know the new york times the washington post you know the the la times all these folks should just really be careful about that I agree with you. All right, let's let's talk a little bit about data science in the last two it. minutes that we have. Let's do it. Um, so there is, I got an uh, an invitation to our beginner friendly thirty days of machine learning challenge, and that starts August second. Um, so for those of you listening, uh, hopefully we'll have this episode out by the twenty sixth by yeah. this coming Monday. Um, so you'll have time to sign up for this. Uh, basically, Kaggle, right? We've talked about Kaggle before. A bunch of times. They're doing they 30 pay, they days. They pay us some money, Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing 30 days of um, uh, of sort of machine learning, right? So every day you get a little challenge. You learn a little bit. You build on it. Uh, so you could go to Kaggle.com um, and, and just learn more about that. Um, it's called Ka- Kaggle.com. If you just went there, I'm sure they'll... It'll be on the main page. If not, it's just slash 30, the word spelled out 30 dash days dash of dash ML. So uh, I'm planning to do this. Obviously, um, life can get in the way, but I'm hoping to to do some some of this to see how it goes out. Um, so so that, that would be question? interesting. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You, you, would you consider yourself a you know knowledgeable seasoned machine learning uh individual um i don't uh, i know so i know enough to get by and talk through the topics but i don't use it every day right my my main job it, yeah my main job is software development so um when it comes to like machine learning yeah i know like i know the you know the topics i know the broad strokes foundational principles um, yeah, but yeah. But there's always something to learn, right? With the the number of algorithms, the number of techniques, the number of ways to do things, the number of uh, ways to analyze data. Um, there's just always more to learn. So you would you would you would do this thirty day program and 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 you think you'd either I'd get something fine tune or get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think um, I th- you know, uh, and sometimes I'll do these things and I'll, I'll be like, oh, this is simple, right? Um, Mm-hmm. But uh, but sometimes I, I also look at it to see, like, is this a good way to learn and a good way to teach, right? Because I, I'm always interested in that. That's a, that's one of the things that um, sort of I, I think about all the time, right? Like, is this nice. the best approach? Nice. So a yeah. lot of it is also, oh, I never heard this explained in this way. This makes this makes sense yeah. to talk about it in yeah, this way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it helps having these conversations too, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, sometimes you hear something, you know, oh wow, um, it'll trigger another thought, and in, in, in your, you know, in your mind will just, um, you know, take it in a different direction. And, yeah, and that's really useful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. No, and I, there's something to be said about surrounding yourself with. Um, uh, I'm going to butcher the quote, but just surround yourself with people smarter than you. Um, yeah, and you'll never stop learning. You know. Yeah. And look, and I tell people all the time, if you want to do something, just 
do it, right? Like, this is free. <laughs> they're setting this up for you for free. Like, it, it's it, it, there's not like, zero, 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 zero when free. I, when I was growing up, I couldn't, like, I can't even imagine this, I know. Uh, this possibility. Not only is it free, but from your house. From your house, yeah. Growing up. And, it, that? and it's all structured, and um, and I'm sure, like, they'll, they'll give you a recap of what you did wrong the next day, right? So, but one thing that came up, um, so data science again, switching topics. Um, did we ever talk about bitemporal tables? No. Okay. No. So a bitemporal table. So it came up in a discussion I had um, a few weeks ago uh, with someone who was asking me if I knew what bitemporal tables were. And I had never heard of, I, I actually had never heard of bitemporal tables, but I've used them. So, mm. so the idea of bitemporal, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually uh, Google it because there's there's uh, there's not only bitemporal, but there's also tritemporal tables. Uh, so the idea of these tables is that, um, so let's say you're working in a database, right? Um, and I've explained to a database to you. Yeah. You know what a database is. Um, but I've explained it to you as like a collection of sheets in Excel, right? Mm -hmm. Like a sim simple, um, but, you know, combined and, you know, it's a database, right? It's, it's a fast lookup. You can get information. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say um, we have a data a database, right? And we have a database of, let's say, um, your name, um, your your um let's say your um your weight your height right um your weight and your height right it's sort of a medical database right so now you go to the doctor and it's you know it's 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 uh, you know it's june whatever uh, it's a new you know it's a new day you go to the doctor a year later and now they record that same information Right now, if they if they record that information and they just type over the old information, right? Then now you don't have a history of how it's how it's happened. Right? I haven't seen how much fatter I've been getting in the last five years. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and so one of the things you have to do is sort of save the time when that information was recorded. Okay. Right. So. Um, so that your weight and your height, let's say height won't change that much after some point, but your weight and height, um, will be from a certain period to a certain period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so the idea of, of, of these ta tables by temporal and tri temporal tables is so that when you query information, right, let's say I want to query information from 2003, right. It's almost like. I don't have to I don't have to worry too much about the data that existed in 2003. The tables are set up in a way that when I query the information it'll give me the results for 2003. So I've specified that this information that I'm entering is valid between, you know, 2002 and 2004. So when I query for 2003, right? Now I get back the results of that information. So if I wanted to say, um, you know, what was the average weight of my patient in, you know, or what was the average BMI of my patient in 2003, I can write a query that says select from, you know, my patient, their weight, you know, and, and do the BMI formula for this date. And the table will sort of say, oh, for that date, here is the information that's relevant. Does that make even, sense to you? Even if there's information in that table from 1999 to today, right, right, right. So the, the information that in that table yeah. should should be changed all the time, almost like a, um, almost like a, uh, I like want to say ledger. Yep, yep. It's yep. like it's like a timestamp on. So th so then so if you think about it, it's like a timestamp of, of information, of. When so there's a couple of different timestamps, and this is where bitemporal and tritemporal and all this stuff becomes mm -hmm. important to people, right? Mm -hmm. Which is when is this information valid from? From what day to what day? 
right? So there's a time stamp and there's a validity uh, phase. Right, but yeah. but that's a time stamp. Let's say I take that information today, right? Like, let's say I take your weight today, right? Yep. Your weight as I know it, right? Uh, what are you, 180 pounds? Yeah, yeah. You wish. <laughs> <laughs> In seventh uh, grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but that information is valid to me from the day I take that measurement to the day I take the next measurement. To the next one, yeah. That's the only, that for me, that's the only valid information I have, right? Mm -hmm. So first I have, I have the measurement and when it's valid from to when it's valid to, right? So that's sort of my time, that, that's a time scale right there, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's a, another piece of information here, which is um, when was the information recorded, So, so that's important too. When was this information recorded? Recorded versus logged into the into the versus uh, when it was database. valid from. Yeah, exactly. Got it. It's almost like when was it actually put into the database? Mm -hmm. Because you may come to me and say, "Hey, I've been measuring myself, right?" And I can say, "Okay, well, you know, give me the measurements." And I can and I can record. I can when did you take that? Oh, I took it about a week ago. Yeah, like that matters. Right. How is this different? It it is different. It is different. But the 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 terms you've been we've been using uh, recording database like a ledger time stamped. How is this? Can blockchain technology not be used to keep this database running without a person's input? Oh well, actually, you can input it, but it's there forever, right? So blockchain is it just certifies information and it's there forever. You went, where do you come with blockchain? We're not talking about blockchain. I know we're not, but <laughs> blockchain also deals with like a ledger, right? It's it's information you know to be true, right? It's 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 factual. That's that's the trust you put into it, right? So there's this they verify the information. That's what the miners do, and then boom, it gets in the it gets a it becomes a part of the chain. Now this is real. You cannot augment that. Yeah, yeah, but th so the thing with blockchain or any ledger-based system is that to for you to know the state of the world, right? Any ledger-based system for you to know the state of the world, you have to go through all of the events that have happened. Yes, I'm with you. You don't have to do that with a database. A database, database has that you information. Query, you just query for what you want. Whereas with the ledger, right? Like if you ever look at your checkbook, right? Like you sure, would sure, have sure. to see like... How the okay, hell did I get to zero? Add, <laughs> subtract, add, yeah. subtract, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and usually you don't... Uh, I mean, you usually have a separate thing that you denote like what actually that ended up to right like i think that's how they used to do it in in, in the day right and when then you in the right all ledger today you would have right. your own yeah yeah you would have your own tally or whatnot um, i see I so see yeah that, that came up just because it's it's really important for um it's really important from for like um for processing of information on you know how, when was this information valid um, when was it entered into the system? Uh, and sometimes, like, when was it entered into the system? When is it applicable for, right? Because, and then when is it valid becomes a different, actually, a different, a different question. thing, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, because yeah. when is it valid may be um, a choice that we make. As a doctor, right? the, in the, using this example. Right. I don't care what I weighed a year ago. I care what I weigh now. Yeah. Right, exactly. Oh, I don't care. Or... I say like I don't care about your you know I like all those measurements are great but I, none of them were va like none mm -hmm. of them were valid in my mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. only the one that I took right correct correct that's interesting yeah so it's interesting um so um and so there are database da databases that sort of support that um intrinsically um and how a lot of um you know, people, um, and how I've done it in the past is that we just have different columns that have that information and we will just update those columns as, as they happen. 
but there are it, there is database technology to support that, That's which funny. basically so does the same thing. You were intuitively doing this anyway because of the work you're in, but now that you got it, That's cool. yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, uh, sometimes it's it's like that, right? Like someone mm-hmm. will say something, and you're like. I don't know what that means. And then you you hear what it is and you say, oh, that's, you know, that's... I know what that is. I know. Yeah, I've, you know, yeah. I've been doing that forever. Like, yes, it's like blockchain. It, can you do it any <laughs> other way? You know, can you can you do it any other way? Yeah, yeah. So don't, um, I would say to, to anyone who, who gets a question or has a conversation with someone who says, hey, I'm doing, I don't know, uh, they say something and you... And you have no idea what it is, right? Don't dismiss it. No, don't don't feel bad by saying, what is that exactly? Can you explain it to me? I've never heard that before. Don't feel bad. I've seen so many people nod and shake and, oh, okay. And then, you know, I'll be the one in the room who says, hey, I'm sorry. I don't know what that is. Can you explain it? And then they explain it. And then everyone's like, oh, that's everyone you know, who was like, nodding goes, thank you, sir, yeah. for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I didn't know either. And, and so I always say, you know, that's why I thank the podcast, right? Because yeah. it allows me to ask people questions. Uh, and I'm just asking for the listeners. I know the answer. You know the answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Antonio. Right, well, it's been a good time catching up, man. Great time catching up. Um, let's do this again sometime. You know, we should start a yeah. podcast together, you <laughs> we, and I. We should, we should do something. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to us this week. Um, we'll check you guys out soon.